So I'm going to say a few more words about me, and then we'll just jump in into the, into the talk. So my name is Gal Sekeli, which just by the name itself, you can see that uh, it's a little complicated and from out of this country. I'm originally from Israel. Uh, I'm a licensed psychotherapist. I work in San Francisco in downtown. Um, and I specialize in working with couples. I see a lot of couples every week. And um, I also founded a center called the couplecenter.org that you can see the information on the slide. And this is a center that is dedicated for uh, couples counseling and, uh, and uh, relationship education. Uh, works in the Bay Area right now, mainly in San Francisco. And um, I actually came here um, to study uh, at CIS University in San Francisco about six years ago. I have a master's in uh, social psychology from Israel, from Tel Aviv University, and then another master from CIS. And um, coming over here was a really big shock for me. Like, uh, you know, in Israel, you know, you see the US a lot because you see TV all the time, and most of TV comes uh, from the US. So you think you know it, and you think, you know, it's really in kind of the same culture. It feels like it's the same you know, relatively the same values and relatively the same norms. But uh, once you come here, you realize, you know, I realize at least that there's a lot of really deep rooted differences. And I kind of had to learn how to survive in this culture. So I really had to learn how to be, um, you know, how to really talk the language and how to be part of this culture. And that made me really reflect on my own culture. And I think in some way, when you move from one culture to another, that's what really helps you to start thinking about yourself and realize that a lot of things that you uh, thought uh, are just obvious, are just for granted, are actually not, are actually very culturally bound and uh, affect your life in a very strong way. And before I go into more of the material, I'm going to sh share like, the story of like, the first time I really got how different, uh, different this culture is from the Israeli culture. And that was even before I moved here, before I moved, you know, like two or three months before I moved here to the US, I came for a visit, I saw the university, and I was looking for a place to stay, just you know, in the first couple of days when I arrived. And uh, since I practice meditation, I practice uh, Buddhist meditation also, uh, so I went to the San Francisco Zen Center, which is right in the heart of the town, and I met with the director over there, and I know that they have some residential uh, program, and so I introduced myself, and we had a meeting, and we talked about it, and you know, we saw we, I wanted to see if it's, uh, it would be possible for at least the first couple, uh, couple of days or for a few weeks to stay at the Zen Center and just live there. And she asked me a little bit about myself and about my meditation practice, and, um, and I told her, and she said, yeah, sounds great, sounds like you're a great fit, no problem, you're welcome to come in whenever you want. And so I said to her, um, you know, there's just one more thing I want to ask you. She said, what? And I said, well, you know, my wife will be joining me, not in the beginning, but a few days after. Is it okay if she stays here with me? Like, how's it work? And uh, she said to me, you know, um, in this community, um, we, we kind of prefer that people that, uh, that stay in the, in the community are people that practice. Is that she practice the same way as you? And I said, well, she practiced a little bit of meditation, but not as daily or not as rigorous as I do that. And so she said to me, you know, but I said, but if it's okay, it's just for a few days, you know, you know, we really kind of find an apartment and we move, we, we move on. And she said, well, you know, I think some people might find it uncomfortable uh, if there's someone in the community that is not uh, practicing. And I said to her, I totally understand and I respect that, but is it, is it okay that just it'll be a temporary thing? <laughs> Yeah, you're already joking, but I didn't get it yet. <laughs> so she said, well, I, you know, I think that, um, I think that it's not, it's not going to be the best idea to do that. And I said, I, you know, the third time, I said, well, I, I totally respect that, but is it okay to make an exception? <laughs> At this point, I started realizing, okay, something is happening here. I realized, you know, it took me a moment, but I realized she's actually saying no. <laughs> but she never used the word no. So in my eyes, you know, coming from Israeli culture, she's saying, well, it's kind of difficult. And I say, okay, it's difficult, but let's resolve it. You know, let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's negotiate. Let's talk about it. And she's saying, no, but, you know, it's just like I'm, I'm not hearing that. So from that point on, it's kind of really made me think of like, okay, there's something really different here. And I got to really learn it because I'm, I'm, go I'm about to live here for the next couple of years. Um, okay. So... Okay, yeah, thank you. 
Is that better? Yes. Okay. And it's a little difficult to. I'm in front of my projector. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Okay, yeah, my slides are usually very simple. Um, so, first of all, what do we talk about when we, when we talk about culture? Okay, there's, very ba there's three basic levels of our experience. There's a personal level, there's a group level, and then there's a universal level. And the tradition of psychotherapy usually looks at the first and the third one. So it looks at the personal, so we're really good, most psychotherapists, we're really good at asking about the personal history of the, per of the, of the client and their family history and how that affected them and the, their own personality structure and whatever method you're using, you're usually doing a lot of questions and a lot of work with that level. And then we also do a lot of work with the level of the universal, of like just you, you know, um, universal needs and universal emotions. You know, if someone goes through grief, there's certain stages for that, which is true for what is a particular person, but it's also true for other people. So we look at like universal issues that people go through, if it's marriage or if it's depression or anxiety or anything like that. But then there's the other level, there's the level of the group, which is hugely, you know, affects us hugely in a daily life. And I'm sure that everybody in this audience and, you know, knows that and, and acknowledge that. You know, there, there's a way in which a lot of the time in psychotherapy, we, we tend to ignore that, that level and how that level really affects us. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different um, factors in that level. Okay, oh, can you go one back? Yeah. So there's, uh, on the left side, you can see there's a lot of type of groups and the way that they affect us. You know, there's a ethnicity group, there's an age group, there's a disabilities group, there's religion group, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, indigenous heritage, national origin, gender. There's a lot of different groups that we are a part of. And each group has its own characteristics and, and affects us in a way that affects us our, our point of view, our values. You know, the way we see the world is affected by being part of all those groups. Okay, and all of those are relevant when we come to do th therapy, and especially, of course, group therapy, in which we have the variety of people, different genders, different ages, different economic status, and different ethnicity, ethnicity etc. And when we look at culture, there's so many ways in which culture, I mean, I'm talking more like um, uh, country or ethnicity type culture, there's so many ways in which that affects therapy. You know, this is like a really short list of all the ways in which it does it, the expression of emotions, the therapist's role, verbal and nonverbal communication, orientation to family, to community, mind-body connection. There's like really almost every aspect that we talk with a client or that we work with client is really affected also by culture. And what I'm going to do in this talk, we're not going to try to cover the whole cross-cultural uh, uh, topic, which is huge and vast and beyond also my, uh, uh, my expertise. We're going to take a use case. I'm going to take the use case of the Israeli culture versus the American culture, and we're going to use the TV series and treatment in order to do that, and just to spark a certain, you know, certain topics, to highlight certain topics in order to kind of create uh, more thinking and more, um, um, let's say, concepts or skills around that that you can actually take into your small groups and talk, talk about it, and then we'll come back together. Okay. So... What this, you know, what I'm going to show you is the TV series in treatment. Now, can I have a show of hands of who saw any episodes? The American, the Israeli, wow. That's a pretty big group. Great. Okay, so you, you'll, you'll have a lot of background of what I'm talking about today. But even if you didn't, that's fine. I'm going to show you the, the, the episodes. So in treatment was created in 2005 in Israel and was very revolutionary because I think it's the first time that you see therapy on the TV screen and only therapy, not part of like uh, Sopranos, if you've seen that. <laughs> and, and really, um, you know, relatively good quality therapy and only that. So there's nothing happening besides two people, therapist and client talking. There's no, you know, no guns, <laughs> no one dies. You know, there's no action, it's just like two people talking and it became, and when they started it, they didn't think if that it's going to be really successful, but it became a real big hit. And it became so popular that also HBO, uh, the American uh, you know, TV chain, uh, bought the, the rights and created the American version of, it, of in treatment. Now, what's interesting about that is that the American version, and especially in the first season that I'm going to show you uh, pieces of it, 
is very much word by word with the Israeli production. It looks like what they did is they took the Israeli text, they translated it to English, they got new actors, and they just did exactly the same. Okay? That makes it really interesting because every time they didn't do exactly the same. If there's a phrase missing or a phrase added, if there's like the body language is different or even the way the office is set up, then it says something about the culture. It means that that particular thing, you know, the American director or writers thought that it could not be translated into this, into this culture. So they had to change it. Okay, so every time we see this small change, it makes, I mean, it makes you wonder, why is that? Why, what does it mean about the cultural differences between these two countries? Okay, and so that will be the basis for our, kind of our um, analysis today. And of course, you know, some of it you, you, can, you, know, um, you can attribute to other things, but I would like you to kind of take the hat on of like, if there's a difference, let's try to see it from the cultural perspective, at least for this talk, so we can maybe learn about something about that. Um, one word about the American culture, okay? So we're gonna use the word American culture a lot, and this is very tricky. I mean, this is a huge country, and it's very diverse, okay? So of course it's very, you know, just saying American culture is already problematic, okay? Um, but we're gonna try to do it anyway, and uh, we're gonna try to talk more about like the white middle class uh, culture, uh, and probably more like East Coast, West Coast, even though in between them there's also differences. Okay? But this is, by the way, part of the phenomena. When you live inside the culture, you can see a lot of the diversity of it. When you come from the outside, you see also more of the unity of it. Okay? So, um, yeah, so I hope you'll be patient with that when we're saying American culture, and of course we, we don't include a lot of the, of the groups in, in, within the American culture. And last thing I want to say, uh, a cautionary remark is that, of course, as I'm talking here also today, I'm also bringing my own biases. Okay, it's like impossible to talk about culture without bringing your own cultural biases. So, of course, everything that I'm saying is negotiable, can be argued, you don't have to agree with me, and uh, even though most of the time I'm right. <laughs> okay, at least not, not according to my wife, but besides, besides her. Okay, so what is it to compare cultures? How do we compare cultures? If we're going to look at the Israeli culture and American culture, how do we do that? How do we compare it? So this is a very simple model that actually I created, um, which, uh, which helps to do that in a, in a very simple way. So it looks at three layers. The top layer is the behavior. It's everything that we can see. So if someone talks in a certain way, talks in a certain language, uses certain words, uses certain body language, uh, whatever is it that they're doing in therapy, that's the behavioral level. It's what we can observe. Obse observe, yeah. But the behavior, as uh, you know, all of us as therapists know, is only one layer, and it also is usually motivated by, uh, by underlying things, right? And in this way, we're going to look at values. So what are the cultural values that are influencing this behavior? And this is going to be things like uh, privacy, or things like you know, connection or things like um, individualism, okay? And those values are actually infusing the behavior that we see. Again, we're looking at the group level, not the personal level. And then the last, the deepest level, is the level of beliefs or narratives. For every culture, they're usually very small. There's just a handful of narratives or beliefs that really affect the values and the values affect the behavior. The stories of like the stories that kind of people tell from generation to the generation that has to do with like what is a good life and what do you want to get and who's a good person in this in this uh, in this culture and we're going to get that towards the end we're going to do a lot of the analysis of the values and then we'll get to the to the narrative towards the end okay so without further ado I'm going to start showing you some um, pieces of in treatment. So just a few words actually of introduction. So okay. <laughs> I'm not dancing, it's just a <laughs> Okay, so a few words of introduction. We're going to see if the, uh, the first episode from a, a client named Alex. Alex is a fighter pilot. 
And this, we're going to see the first uh, moments of therapy, so the first session. And um, in the American version, Alex is a, is a pilot in, uh, in the American Navy. And he comes back after a bombing in Iraq. In the Israeli uh, version, uh, he's uh, a pilot in the, in the Air Force. And he comes back after a bombing in Ramallah, which is in the occupied territories. And um, he's also married, he has two kids. And you know, th things that happen to him around the bombing is really bothering him, that's why he comes to therapy. But in the course of therapy, there's a very problematic, very charged relationship that is created between him and, him and the therapist. Uh, which is a, a lot of it has to do with projection of, also of his relationship with his dad that was a very strict and very kind of dominating uh, uh, perspective, uh, person. So in this first episode, uh, he's just coming into therapy and I'm going to show you the first three minutes of therapy. And um, I would like you to notice, to try to notice a couple of things. One, there's going to be a slight difference in the content of what he's saying. Okay, so try to notice that. The other thing is um, the body language is going to be different. So try to notice those two things and then we're going to talk about them and try to understand them. So do you recognize me? No. I'm sorry, sh uh, should I? Well, I was told you're the best. A man in tune with everything around him, so yes, I guess you should. Thank you, but I, I, do, I do think that in this profession the uh, the best is really a matter of uh, personal opinion. No, no, no. The best can be established by facts and figures. You're the best. I did my research. A couple of former patients, someone else who knew you from graduate school. Does that pressure you? Is it important for you to know that I am the best? Yes. Okay, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. אמרו לי שאתה הכי טוב שיש. תודה, אבל... אני באמת מאמין שהכי טוב המקצוע שלי זה עניין אישי לגמרי. טעות. הכי טוב זה עניין אמפירי. אתה הכי טוב, ואני תחקרתי את הנושא. שני מטופלים לשעבר, מטופל אחד עכשווי, וצלע מהמשפחה, מעגל שני. אתה מתכוון לומר ששאלת את כל האנשים האלה עליי? כן. אתה מלחיץ אותך? קצת. העובדה שדיברת עם בן משפחה שלי... כן, זה קצת מלחיץ אותי. אין לך מה לדאוג. כולם אמרו שאתה תותח. The best. אוקיי, so... Great, thank you. So, yes, what did you see? What did you see different? I'll take just a few comments, just because your big audience will do it kind of short, and then I'll kind of continue, yeah. Right. Language was direct. Right. Right. It was, he was sitting close and he was leaning forward the whole time and didn't move. Like it was a very direct eye contact between them the whole time. Yeah. Yes? The Israeli therapist admitted he was feeling pressure in the US. Right. Exactly. The, the American therapist, when asked, you know, does it pressure you, came back with a question, you know, the, you know, the classic uh, therapist trick. Is it important to you to know that I'm the best? And the Israeli actually answered that. He said, yeah, the fact that you talk to one of my relatives, I do feel some pressure. Yeah? Yes? Did they talk to the relative in both cases, or one case they said to colleagues and one to relatives? Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and you can, I, I don't, most of you can't see her body language, but it was something like this to a relative, wow. Okay, so there is something important about that, and yeah, you're right, it was different. In the Israeli version, which I, again, I remind you is the original one, he says, I, too, I talked to two of your former patients, a current patient, and a relative from the extended family. <laughs> he actually says the word second, uh, second circle, but it's extended family. In the American version, he says, I talked to two of your former patients and a colleague from graduate school. No current patient and no relative. Okay, interesting, right? Yeah. Right. 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 
Right, you're exactly right. So I'll just repeat what you said. Uh, first of all, in the American version, he's, he's African American, so it's a minority. In the Israeli version, he's, um, he's, they're both the same, uh, the same um, ethnicity, so they're both Ashkenazi. And um, also, in the, the, the status of the military is different in the two countries. Like in Israel, everybody has to go to the military, so it's mandatory. And Air Force is considered like the best. So like the best of the best go to the Air Force. And the, in the American uh, military, a, a lot of people don't go to the military, so it's not considered in the, same, in the same status as the Israeli military when you go there. So there's some judgment or some thoughts that some people might have about someone who goes to the military. And it's a different culture, it's not a regular culture. In Israel, everybody goes through it, so they're used to a military culture in some way. Okay? So all of those are really, really important uh, differences, and thanks for pointing them out. And let's talk a little bit what, about what they mean. Okay, and again, once we, now we move from the behavior to the value, so we're adding interpretation. So again, it's open to a lot of different ways of interpretation. Um, so, I think one thing about the, using the, you know, the uh, current client and the relative. Okay? First of all, it's just, it's just facts. Israel is a very small country. There's six million or seven million people in Israel. It's very easy to know someone that knows someone. Okay, you know, there's usually, they say there's six degrees of separation for every person to every person. In Israel, it's two. <laughs> that means that I always know someone that, that you also know, you know, or that knows you. It's very easy to find someone that knows someone, so it's just easy to find someone who's your relative from the extended family. In America, it's very, it's very difficult. You grew up in one place, you live in a different place, it's a huge country, it's very difficult to do that. At the same time, you know, there's a different reaction that comes up I think for, for Americans versus Israelis, if someone tells, said to them, you know, I, I talk to your relative, it feels like you're stalking me. You might be dangerous. I have to be, you know, be a lot more careful with you. Okay? And that comes, if you look at the value level, it comes from a really strong value in the American culture around privacy. So it's very ingrained, very rooted in, in, the, in, the, in the American culture that I can have my own privacy, my own space, you know, and my own, you know, confidential information just, just for myself. And it's not okay for someone to kind of cross that boundary and invade my privacy, right? If you go around in the U.S. in many places, you see fences and there's a sign on them, you know, don't cross, because if you cross, you know, you might, be, you might get shot. Like, this is my own territory, and that's it. Okay, so there's privacy in the American culture. There's also anonymity. Okay, again, because this is a big country and a lot of people move all the time, then you, you come to a new place and no one really knows you. No one knows your roots, no one knows who's you, who you are, or who's your family. And so you can re rebuild yourself and you can recreate yourself in a very easy way. In the Israeli culture, it's kind of the reverse. It's more about connectedness and enmeshment. Okay? Not necessarily in the negative words, both, of, both negative and positive. Okay? So as I said, everybody knows everybody. And uh, either went, you know, served with them in the military, or went to um, a university with them, or you just know someone that knows someone, and so everybody is, I feel, very, very close and very, very connected. And beyond that, people always feel like they can really come to you and tell you what they think about you. In some ways, like people are, you know, can, can be in your business very easily, and they feel in some way entitled to it, not just entitled to it, it's like if they don't do it, they're, they are, they're not good friends. You know, I had, a, I had a friend actually in Israel who was American, he came to work in a, in a tech company. I, I used to work in tech before I became a therapist. And he said to me, you know, everybody tell me what I need to do, how to do my job. And it's really disturbing, why do they don't respect me? And I said, no, it's not that they don't respect you, they actually like you. They come and give you advice in order for you to make your, your job better. Okay, but it's a very different uh, cultural mentality. And so if you think about it, if you already start to make the parallel into, um, into the way you lead groups and having multi, uh, multicultural people in the group is like the, their style around you know, connect, connection and around privacy and around like is it, is it okay to speak up or not or to say your, your opinion and in what way is going to be very, very different. And I have to tell you, my, me personally, I had a lot of troubles with that. You know, there was, I, I remember a personal story of I was in school and the teacher said something like, you know, she just gave a new article to read that she never gave before and she asked in the class, um, what did you actually think about this article? You know, because the first time I, I gave it, and the first person said something like, you know, I really liked the first part. It was really interesting, kind of thought-provoking. The second person said, like, you know, I, I kind of liked the summary. The summary was good. The, you know, kind of like the overall was good. And when she, you know, everybody was like that. And when she came to me, 
I said, uh, I didn't like the article. Okay, I was just, you know, I was just being, for me, I was just being, you know, honest. I'm being direct. And, and she, she looked at me and she said, uh, I can always count on you to say the truth. <laughs> and I didn't think I'm doing anything unique. You know, I was just like, that's the way that my, my communication, that's what the way I, I used to be, in, you know, I, I grew up with in communication. So in Israeli culture, there's, a, there's an emphasis on what we call dugri, which is saying things as they are and saying them directly to the other person's, uh, in the, to the other person's face. And so this, of course, has both sides, right? Every value that I'm going to say tonight, you know, every value that every culture holds has two sides, and that's important to keep in mind. Okay, so privacy has a great value of like, you know, have your own personal space and, it, uh, and, um, and you know, you can do whatever you want over there. The other side of privacy, it could be loneliness. If you create too much space, then you're alone and you're not very, really connected. If you look at the Israeli side, you know, saying things directly could be like very honest, very genuine, or it could be very aggressive. Okay, so that's the, the other side, that's the shadow side of the same, of the same value. Okay, body language, you mentioned the body language. So in the American version, he sits back more, so he gives more personal space. And also there's a moment, a moment of tension in which he, he says to him, like, does it pressure you? I don't know if you notice, at that moment he actually doesn't look at the, at the therapist. What he does is he moves back and he picks up a book or a kind of an album from behind and starts looking into it. So he kind of breaks connection. In some way he breaks the intensity of the connection between them. Okay? In the Israeli version, you say that you saw that the body language was very, very direct. It was very sitting forward. It's like engaged in some way that it's kind of like, you know, we're really going to match each other in, in, in our forces and we're going to really check each other. So the body language could be very different. It could mean different things. Like body language like this of an Israeli, if they, they are in your therapy room or if they are in your group, you might interpret that as aggressiveness. While an Israeli might interpret it as directness or strength. Okay, so every time we go into interpretation, what I'm inviting you to do is like, is it personal or is it group level? Is it cultural or group level? You know? I, so I said to you that I work a lot with couples and I work also a lot with Israeli couples. And usually in the first session in Israeli couples, it looks like this. And, and the first question is like, so tell me about yourself, to me. <laughs> okay, uh, even before I can, you know, start speaking. And so um, um, again, you can see that as very aggressive, as very challenging, or you can see it as part of the culture of like there is kind of like that's the dance of getting to know each other. And there's something actually in the Israeli culture of like suspicious to begin with, but once you move the first barrier, a lot of trust. Like people will be your friends forever in some way. So if you know, if you know to expect that, then you don't get you know, shaken by it. Okay. Okay, so next we're gonna move to another episode by, with Alex. This is gonna be the third session and um, Things move really fast in the movie, so this is a very, uh, a very uh, dramatic th third session in which there is a really strong conflict between Alex and the therapist. Um, the therapist sees that as really trying to, you know, really projecting the father image on the therapist and trying to break through that uh, or trying to kind of challenge him. And um, we're gonna, I'm going to show you the American version and the Israeli version. And try to look at the styles of conflict, like what do you know about the styles of conflict between them? And uh, yeah, body language you're going to see again. And also, I'm going to pause in a certain moment, and I want you to look at just the office so for a moment to put aside the scene. Just look the way the office is set up, and we're going to talk about that. It must be very difficult for you to have lived in the shadow of somebody who, who thinks like that. You've got to be, you've got oh, to wait, be like wait. iron all the time. Do, do you see how you twist things around? Well, am I ever going to get out of this alive? I mean, if I said he was a pussy, you'd have a comment about that. No, I said he was a hero. You'd have a comment about that. I mean, you, you love to sit here, you listen to people's problems, so you can probably sit on your porch at the end of the day and just tell yourself, wow, right. my life is so great. Can we stay focused on what the issue is we're trying to deal with here? The difficulty that you must have had 
living in the shadow of your father in a world where you're not allowed to express who you are your tender side maybe your your, your feminine side for example so what do you do the only thing you can do is defy him you have to fight with everything you have but you know something alex you haven't done that you haven't dared to do that your father is such a powerful imposing character that you're terrified he'll crush you so you come through this door with all your rage your resentment your jealousy your your buried anger toward him you bring it in here and you let it loose on me that's what you do but that's okay that's fine well that's why i'm here i think that's the most patronizing thing i've ever heard זה נשמע לא פשוט לגדול בצל של מישהו כמו אבא שלך. למה? כי זה סטנדרט שאי אפשר באמת לעמוד בו. איך אתה מסובב את זה? תגיד, יש איזה דרך לצאת מכם בשלום? אם הייתי אומר שהוא היה סמרטוט, היה לך מה להגיד. אם הוא היה מוצלח, אז יש לך מה להגיד. אתה פשוט יושב פה כל היום, מחפש בעיות של אחרים, כדי שבסוף היום אתה תוכל להתיישב במרפסת שלך, ולהגיד לעצמך, אח, כמה שהחיים שלי טובים. אתה מקנא בי? לא. כי אני לא מאמין לסיפור הזה. אני לא מאמין למושלמות הזאת שאתה מנסה לייצג. לא קונה את הפוזה הזאת. אתה יודע איפה גדילים טרוריסטים? אם תראה לי את הצלום מהאוויר, כן? הם גדילים בצד אימפריות. אימפריות זה מה שיוצר טרוריסטים. וטרור זה התרסה. זו עקיצה באוזן של הפיל. אני מנסה להבין אם ההתרסה שלך נובעת מהקושי שלך לחיות בצל של אימפריה, של דמות אב כל כך חזקה. כמעט הייתי אומר עריצה, שאסור להביע מולה שום חולשה, שום רגשי אשמה, שאסור לחשוף מולה שום צד רך יותר, נשי יותר. ואז מה שנשאר לך לעשות מול אבא כזה, זה להתריס מולו בכל הכוח להילחם בו, להראות לו שאתה יותר טוב ממנו. שאתה יכול לנצח אותו. ונדמה לי שזה מה שאתה עושה פה, מולי. את כל הכעס שיש לך על אבא שלך, את כל התסכול שלך והקנאה שלך באיש הברזל המושלם הזה, אתה מוציא פה עליי. וזה בסדר. בשביל זה אני פה. אוקיי, אז מה אתם רואים בזה אפיזוד? כן. מה שאני רואה בזה זה שאתה מבין Mm-hmm. the American version is. It's mm-hmm. almost insulting that the, the, the Israeli version is this brilliant parallel where, you know, here's a military warrior who's fighting against terrorists, and yet in his own life he's living the same struggle internally. Right. And the producers think that the Israeli audience is smart enough to get that, and the American producers think that we're not smart enough to get it. right Okay, okay. That's another perspective, yeah? It seems to me that um, the therapist, I felt that often with him as I watched all the videos, seemed more wounded by the attacks in the patient. Right. And the Israeli therapist seemed to receive them without seeming, uh, I, I, don't know, I, I don't know the best, typical, mm-hmm. but it may be. Right, right. Yeah, so uh, just repeat if someone didn't hear, She was saying that the American uh, therapist seems more wounded by the attacks, and the Israeli seems a little less. And she said, you know, also, as I watched the, the series, it seems like he's very affected by everything that's happening there. Yeah, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Yes? Uh, the affect seems different. The American version seems to be more outward with their affect. Uh-huh. Really right, right. It's interesting, right? Because in the first episode I showed you, The Israeli seems like sitting a lot closer and a lot more direct. 
So it seems like it's a lot more intense. Then in this one, it actually looks the reverse. It looks the American version seems very, very intense. And actually, I, I don't show you. I used to show the, the, what's happening in the rest of the episode, in which it really goes dramatic. So it's just way over the top, in which he, you know, he tells the therapist that he knows that his wife is cheating on him, and he made a lot of investigation and research about him, and he knows all of that stuff. And the therapist loses his temper and actually, you know, kind of approaches the, the client, you know, and the Alex, and so it becomes over dramatic. So I kind of cut it out. But in the American version, it's actually more dramatic than the Israeli version. Like, he, he really attacks him in some way. In the Israeli version, he touches him and then moves back and says, I'm sorry. Okay, so it's interesting. We'll try to understand how, how it kind of, the, you know, the tables are turned in that way. Yeah? But actually, I think in the first one, um, you miss that we would see the pilot being very aggressive in right. picking up. In picking up the, the, the book. Mm -hmm. It's really an invasion of right. privacy and right. space again. So he's actually very, being a very aggressive Right. Exactly, it's a different way of aggression. Yeah, you're right, and that I'm gonna, you know, talk about it in the back. Yeah, yeah, uh, you, yeah. <laughs> the one who's looking back. Yeah. Yeah, there was an airplane in the background and the car that stopped, and the you know the door was open. <laughs> and it wasn't on purpose. I read the scripts. <laughs> right, right. So there's, there's a lot more darker, it's a lot more heavy furniture in the American version. And the Israeli is a lot more open, a lot more airy, um, and less status also in some way. Okay, one more and then I'll. The American version seems more interested in making drama out of the therapist's counter transference. Right, right. Exactly. There's more drama in general. You know, it's also true for the, the next uh, uh, character I'm going to show you, the, the, the woman. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's more drama. Yeah. But also out of the, out of the therapist's emotion. And mm -hmm. It's all structured around him ending the week with his own therapist, in which there's also a lot of interpersonal drama. Yeah, the, that structure is actually the same. So in the Israeli version, it's the same structure. He goes to supervision, which is kind of like supervision therapy at the same time. It's not very clear what's happening there. The second season, it becomes couples therapy also there. Very, very poor boundaries. So the, the writers didn't do a good, a good job over there. So the structure is kind of the same, but there's more emotions, that we, more kind of like losing control that we see in the American version than the Israeli one, like we saw right now. So let's try, let's try to talk about it a little bit and, 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 and analyze this. Uh, again, every anal analysis is just a perspective, but um, um, I think there's a way in which an Israeli culture is very used to conflict. You know, we have 60 years of, of, of you know, Israel independence, which has probably had like five or six big wars. wars. Politics and, and, and conflict is everywhere in the news. You know, if you open the, the radio in Israel, every hour on the hour you hear the news. No way to escape out of it. So this, you know, conflict is so ingrained in the culture that in some way it's not, su it's not such a big deal. Okay, in some way it's kind of like easier to, to be with or to handle conflict because it's, it's, it's so ingrained in the culture in some way. You know, a lot of people say that Israelis are very argumentative. You know, you say something, they say the opposite. Not always just to be, you know, aggressive, but just to kind of make conversation and to, to make it more heated or more debate, you know. Someone, someone told me over dinner, I won't expose the names, that, that, that a certain person that she knows who's Israeli, when he's working with his clients, it sounds like they're always arguing. She can't understand what they, what they say because it's a different language, but it sounds like they're always arguing. Okay? So it's very part and ingrained in the culture, and so I think that's what we see. The therapist in the Israeli version doesn't get too rattled about the, the conflict, and they kind of continue. And when he says to him, like, you probably just do it so you can sit with your friends on, you know, on, the, on your balcony or your porch and just enjoy your life. And he, he kind of smiles and says, like, do you envy me? So he kind of takes it and, and rolls with it rather than get uh, aggressive with it. And um, in the American version, since there's more respect to boundaries, since there's more politeness in some way, even in New York style, there's a little bit more politeness than Israel. <laughs> I know it's different than, than, than California. Okay. But still, there's more politeness than when you come to conflict, it becomes, a, you know, it could be more of like, you know, you're breaking the rules. Like, this is really like, now it's really intense. Now all gloves are off. And this is what's happening with Alex and, and, and the therapist. 
Like he becomes like gloves off. And the, the, the other part that I'm not showing you because it gets too dramatic is really gloves off. Like he moves around the office, he takes stuff, he comes and sits you know, close to him, really close to him, like, like this. You know, as he's talking to him, like completely threatening him. Like it becomes a lot even more aggressive than the Israeli version. The other piece is like another way to look at it, like you said, is like, you know, the American tele television maybe wanted to add more drama. So maybe it's not just about the therapist client, it's more maybe just also the perception of the, of the American TV. But then again, you ask yourself, why is that? This is also something that characterizes the, the culture, right? Uh, you know, if you see how long this, the, the episodes are, I think the Israeli episodes are 30 minutes long and the American are 22 minutes long. If you see the opening song, the opening theme, the Israeli version is longer than the American one. So in some way, there's, a, I think, something in the American culture of condensing, making it fast, making it like, you know, get, handing it over to you in a, in, a, in a faster way, in a more dramatic way than in the Israeli version. Not that Israel is not dramatic and fast, but the um, you know, American culture might be a little bit more, especially the media one, okay? Another perspective to see here is, um, again, we can look at the conflict between them as conflict between, um, you know, projection of a personal, you know, personal person, like a, your father figure projected on the therapist and then you're fighting with a the therapist. We can also see that as a cultural issue. Like we have, like you said before, there's an African-American and there's a white therapist. So this brings up issues of um, uh, privilege, issues of oppression and issues of minority. Right, so in a way, you can look at it as, as also Alex is fighting uh, the fight of the minority versus the majority or versus the privileged uh, group uh, between them. It's interesting that that's missing in the Israeli version. Israeli version, they're all, they're all the same uh, nationality. It's not that Israel doesn't, don't have uh, uh, Ethiopians that are also uh, dark skin or um, Russians that are new immigrants and still not enculturated. You know, there are a lot of different groups in Israel also but they're not represented in TV so much. And that's interesting, and I think the reason for that is that in some way Israel is still in the stage of like the melting pot. Everybody's the same, there's a, there's a tendency that's trying to say everybody's the same and let's not, um, let's not uh, uh, focus on the differences. In, in, in the US, even though there's still a lot more work to be done around the, you know, diversity, there's a little bit more of awareness for that. So then they choose they choose uh, 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 an actor who is African American, you know, in order to at, at least try to uh, appeal or try to represent that uh, that audience. So that's another interesting uh, difference. Uh, the political context again, politics in Israel very much everywhere, all the time. You know, the sting in the ear of the elephant, and also controversial politics because what he's saying actually in Israel, also the Israel is actually the empire. When you compare it to Palestinians and you know, the Arabs around, Israel is the most powerful nation around. So Israel is also, also the empire. But, so they, but they, you know, there's a permission to talk about you know, controversial politics in, in the mainstream media. And in some way, I think in the HBO, they wanted to avoid that. They wanted to avoid the controversy, and so they took it out. So that's also interesting. So connecting that also, again, coming back to, to therapy and to um, uh, group therapy, you know, this brings up issues of privilege and oppression, which I'm sure all of you are, most of you are aware of, like when you, when you have minority in your groups, this is a really big issue. You know, having the white privilege and having the, uh, being in somewhere color blind when you're white. Usually you don't really see a lot of the, you know, it's very easy for people that are from the ruling minority or from the, you know, from the white to say like, you know, we're all the same. Why are you saying all of this? We're all the same and kind of not realizing that we actually, a lot of people, you know, when you're white, you have actually privilege. So it's easy to not just to uh, be uh, confronted with your, with your culture. So issues of, uh, of uh, um, power and issues of oppression will come up in a group when there's minorities uh, and it's not um, homogeneous. Um, okay. Yeah, and conflict, again, conflict is, uh, you know, usually is a really important um, component of group therapy, right? You know, we usually have, you know, whatever model of group that you use, there's a stage in which a lot of conflict happens. And then what, what's conflict look like is also a culturally bound, like we saw over here. And I'll give you also a personal example. Um, when I was an intern, uh, I, I started, in, you know, I was in an office together with another colleague of mine who was uh, American, white American. And uh, 
we actually st started that office together, and so we designed the office together. So we bought the furniture together and put it together, and um, and it started. You know, half of the week was his, and half of the week was mine. Big mistake. <laughs> Don't ever design anything with anyone else. It's really difficult, especially if they're a therapist. It took us three months, I think, to figure out what couch to have. <laughs> and like midway through the process, about a month and a half into the process, my friend came to me and he said to me, you know, I think we should just stop this whole thing. We should, you know, just um, you go our separate ways. And I said, why? And he said, well, you know, it seems like we're just in conflict all the time. We keep arguing about everything, you know, what to buy, how to do it, you know, and it's just like it might be ruining our relationship. So I'd rather have our relationship, our friendship, rather than, you know, having our office together. Maybe it's better to just separate. And I said to him, really honestly, very innocently, I said, are we in conflict? I said, I thought we were negotiating. You know, for me, the intensity of our communication was not conflict. It was more like, you know, we're expression of, of differences, and at a certain point, we'll find something that works for both of us, and we'll just, you know, go ahead. Um, but for him, it was pretty intense. So I realized, okay, my style doesn't come across really well. And so think about, you know, um, someone in your group that that's their style of talking that's their style of kind of come engaging in communication i'll give you another example i have a couple i, I worked with the woman is from the middle east and the, the the man is white american so the woman all her life until they got married lived in the middle east and when they are in, in session the woman cons constantly talks over him and interrupts him and says a lot of examples and talks a lot okay and he gets really furious with that. So you can look at it as a personal difference, which is also, but you can also look at it as a cultural difference. Again, Middle East, just the same as, as, as Israel, you know, people speak very fast and they talk over each other. And for them, for, for us, it's like, an, it's like normal conversation. This is not rude. In American culture, it's very rude, especially in the West Coast, like you wait. And when, you, when someone ends, there's a pause, and after the pause, you talk. Okay? If you listen to two Israelis talk, there's no pause. If you, if you paused, you lost. Okay. Last thing is about the, the way the office is set up. So you saw the American offices were a lot more heavy furniture, in some way a lot more expensive. Let's face it. Uh, the Israeli office looks like the, you know, the, the therapist bought everything in Ikea and it's already five years used, right? And also his shirt, if you look at his shirt, it looks like, you know, it just came out of laundry and it's not that great, okay? So what does it say about the culture? Because there's a lot of, there's a difference between American and Israel culture about formality. If you go back to the first episode in which he said, I talked to someone who knew you from graduate school. Okay, graduate school is part of what puts you in a status, right? If you went to Harvard, you're in a certain status. If you have this level of furniture in your office, you look successful. And it's not that it's different in Israel. Of course, there's status symbols in Israel also, but it's not as important. Okay? It's not as important. And that's why it's okay, you know, in both series, this is a very successful therapist. He's portrayed as a successful therapist and wealthy therapist, but it's not shown through those symbols in a way. In the American version, he also calls him doctor. So it's a PsyD or a PhD. In the Israeli version, you know, it's only he calls him by his first name. Okay? So those things, again, are, 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 are symbols. There's been, a, um, on the, in the 50s or the early 60s, uh, there was a researcher named Hofstede that did research across almost m most of the countries in the world to look at cultural differences and values. And one of the uh, things that he had is called power index, which means when someone is in a different hierarchy than you, how far is it actually in your relationship? Is it kind of more of a mutual friendship? Can you talk to him? Do you socialize with him? You know, can you give them feedback? Or is that actually really far? Like you don't, you know, you, res you know, it's a different um, mannerism, you respect them, you don't really talk to them, etc. And countries really uh, are different around that. And um, US is not that high in terms of like power difference, but Israel is even lower than that. Okay, so your boss in Israel culture will be more your friend than the American culture. And if you take it into the therapy context, the role of the therapist, okay, is an authority, right? How far is it from the client? 
So we're seeing in the Israeli version that the therapist is a lot more kind of interpersonal. So again, you know, being interpersonal is also a therapy method. It's approach. You can be interpersonal in American culture as well as in Israeli culture. But if we look at it just from the cultural perspective in some way, it's because the power differential feels a little different because of the culture. It's less of an authority figure. It's more of like really common. It's very common for my Israeli clients to ask me personal questions about my life. Very common. And they'll be very surprised if I don't answer. OK, because this is just part of the culture. Um, OK. So again, thinking about group therapy, what's the role of the therapist in the group, in the, or the facilitator in the group therapy? How far are they? How far are you? Are you more in common with the group, or are you more far, more kind of like, say, authority, or more um, kind of like a doctor in some way? With some cultures, there's an expectation. Some minorities in the US, there's an expectation that you'll be more of an expert, more of a doctor. With other, uh, with other cultures, like with the white, for example, uh, white American, there's less of an expectation of you being just kind of like the removed uh, doctor or the removed expert. OK, so next we're going to move into uh, the female uh, version of in treatment, or the female character. Uh, her name is Laura. And she is a um, nurse practitioner, a doctor in her 30s. And I'm going to show you a piece of the first episode. But the first episode shows uh, as if they're already a year in therapy. So it looks like they're a year in therapy. And she comes in for a lot of personal uh, um, relationship stuff with her boyfriend that uh, they're thinking about getting married. And then she's not so sure. And um, throughout the, the series, she's actually uh, have a erotic transference with a the therapist and tries to seduce him. And he, because he's, sorry, because his relationship is also failing and he has troubles with his wife, almost gets seduced, actually. So it's not a really good uh, example of, of therapy, but um, works with the drama. OK, so I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to show you the first uh, episode that you see in the series. But again, this is after a year of therapy. And what I would like you to try to focus on are two things. One, what type of personality do you see? So again, it's the same text, but the personality is going to look very different between the Israeli version and the American version. So try to see what, what's the personality and why, why is that? What are you thinking about that? The other thing is try to, to see the relationship between the therapist and the client. Is this the same, or is there different roles there? Okay. I'm sorry, Paul. I, I should have called it off. I shouldn't have come. You should have come here. What happened last night? What didn't happen? The long version or the bottom line? Because the bottom line is very simple. My life is over. Then you better tell me the long version. I left Andrew. I had a big blowout. Screaming, crying, the works. And at some point, I, uh, I called Alona, and we went out for a drink, and we had a few drinks. Listen, I'm not here. I'm, I'm so totally not here. You are very much here, Laura. No, it's not me that's here. Believe me, you'd be shocked to know the person that's sitting here. Some terrible things last night. Oh. I feel sick. I don't want to throw up. It doesn't matter. It's no big deal. What do you mean? It's vomit. I'm not going to vomit all over your rug. It's a cheap rug, Laura. Let's talk about what's really going on here. I'm 
אני חושב שדווקא מאוד היית צריכה לבוא אליי היום, להראות את עצמך. דווקא ככה, בלי פילטרים, חשופה. אולי תנסי בכל זאת לספר לי מה קרה? מה קרה? כן. מה לא קרה? אתה רוצה את הגרסה הארוכה או את השורה התחתונה? כי השורה התחתונה מאוד פשוטה, החיים שלי התפרקו. אני רוצה את הגרסה המלאה. ברחתי לאברי מהבית. רבנו נורא, צרחות, בכי, הכל של שנינו. ובאיזשהו שלב התקשרתי לאלונה ו... הלכנו לשתות משהו, ואחרי כמה דרינקים, תשמע, אני לא פה, אני ממש לא פה. אני דווקא מרגיש שאת מאוד פה. לא, זה לא אני שפה. תאמין לי, אתה תהיה בשוק ממי שפה. אני עשיתי דברים איומים אתמול בלילה. יש לי כזאת בחילה, אני מפחדת שאני אקיא. נו, ומה יהיה אם זה יקרה? אני מעדיפה למות מאשר להקיא לך על שטיח. שטיח זה לא העניין פה, אני מתאר לעצמי. לא, שטיח זה לא העניין פה. למה זה נראה לך כזה אסון להקים מול הפסיכולוג שלך? זה לא להקים מול הפסיכולוג, זה להקים מולך. אין מצב בחיים. אין מצב לאבד שליטה מולי? אבל הנה דווקא הגעת לכאן, שקורה, חיכית בחוץ, בכית פה בפעם הראשונה. אני חושב שאת דווקא כן רוצה לאבד שליטה מולי. אוקיי. Okay. Now that you've met Laura, what do you think? <laughs> Intimate encounter with Laura. Yes? Um, it's interesting, I find the Israeli version of Laura more contained, less histrionic, less borderline. Uh, <laughs> you know, she just really, to me, she's, that way of being feels more appealing to me. Right. So I would say that the American version more histrionic, more borderline, Israeli more contained. Yeah. The American version more seductive, he says, and the, the therapist playing to it more. Okay. Even though the, you know, the Israeli version, she says something pretty direct. She says, like, um, it's not throwing up in front of my therapist, it's throwing up in front of you. Yeah. But it comes across as less seductive. It's very interesting, right? Yeah. Okay. There's a real strong implied age difference between the two in the American, where Laura's in a little girl state. Right. And the therapist assumes an authoritative right. state. And the, the, between the Israeli version, they're much more fair. Right. Right, again, exactly, so I'll repeat what you said. In the American version, the, she plays more of a little girl role, and the therapist takes more of an authoritating, authoritative uh, role. And in the Israeli version, there's a little more on the same level. And actually, their, their age is portrayed different. The Israeli version, she's 35. American version, she's 30. So they actually chose an uh, actress, and actually said, they say they aged you know, during the series. It's a different age. Anything else? Yep. I found it interesting when she said she was going to throw up in the American version. He says, oh, it's a cheap rug. <laughs> <laughs> and in the Israeli version, he says, I don't think the rug is the issue. Right. Right. In the American version, he, he, he talks about the rug. It's a cheap rug, so it's OK to throw up. In the Israeli version, he says, it's not about the rug. It's about throwing up in front of me. Yeah. OK? Just to give you a little more background, and uh, she had a huge fight, a really huge blowout with her boyfriend. She left the house, she went to drink with a friend. Uh, they got really drunk. Actually, something happened there, sexual, with another guy. She came in, it's 5 o'clock in the morning, she came in, she sat outside until 9 o'clock in the morning when the therapist came. Okay? So it, she's a really in a devastated place. Does she look very devastated in the Israeli version? Yeah. Not that much. Very much in control. Okay, even though this is like probably one of the lowest points in her life in some way. She almost cheated on her boyfriend. She stayed outside. She was drunk. She didn't sleep. Okay? So all of that. So I think all of you, you're saying all of the really important stuff is that we actually see two different personalities here. Right? It's almost, you know, even if you put the same text, it's two different personalities. And I really had to think a lot about that. Like I was wondering, like, why is that? What does that mean? 
What does it mean that the American version, the, 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 the female figure is portrayed this way, and why is it portrayed that way in the Israeli version? And um, what, what I think, you know, uh, when I'm coming to interpret that is that there's different images of, um, um, of the personality structure of what accepted as a, as, a, as a female in some way in the media, like in the, ma in the mass media or in, like in, a, in a masculine world in some way. Okay, so if you look at the American version, in some ways she's, uh, she's really helpless. She portrays like part of her defense as part of her of, like, of, of, of uh, personality structure is like she re she's really pleading towards the therapist saying, I'm really helpless here. You really have to help me. You know, I don't know if you noticed, but there's moments in which she just looks at him and like her makeup is, you know, is all messed up and she looks up at, to him as if she's a little girl, just like you said. Like, I'm, I'm not powerful, and because of that, the therapist also takes a more powerful role. She says, I shouldn't have come, and he said, you should have come. Like, very direct, very, you know, in some way, okay, cut and dry, okay? Like a father talking to a child, you should have come. And she, se she seems really helpless, she cries a lot more in the American version, okay? So we see, um, in, in perspective that I look at, it's kind of coming from, uh, uh, the history of more body-mind oriented psychotherapy, we call it character strategy. The character strategy here is um, I'm going to make myself in some way small. I'm going to make myself vulnerable and somewhat weak and then through that I'm going to, I'm going to gain your own uh, cooperation. I'm going to gain, you're going to take charge, you're going to be st strong and you're going to protect me through me being in some way more vulnerable and more helpless. Okay, and, and that's the um, that's the uh, picture that, uh, that we see over here. If you look at the Israeli version, she's very put together. When the therapist tells her, you know, I think you wanted to come like this. You wanted to lose control in front of me. This part doesn't exist in the American version because she doesn't look in control. Right? She looks helpless. So, you know, it's, it's just not relevant. But in the Israeli version, she is in control. And that's a different type of strategy. That's a different type of defensive structure. The defensive structure, which is very common in the Israeli culture, is I cannot show my vulnerability. If I show my vulnerability, you, go, you might uh, you know, may, you know, uh, ridicule me, or step over me, or it's just, you know, I'm gonna look as weak. And it's true for both men and women. Okay, we, na we naturally think about it as for men, as part of that defensive structure, but it's also true for Israeli culture, a lot of it for, me, for women. So, you know, again, it's a, it's a country in some way in war. Okay, vulnerability, not that encouraged. Not even for women. Okay, so the whole issue of, of, of uh, Naama, in the Israeli version of Laura, losing control become, become parts of it. Also, she used a lot of more sarcasm. Okay, she smiles, if you look at it a lot of the time. It's not a smile of happiness, it's a smile of sarcasm. Okay, and again, that's another def you know, uh, defensive structure, very common to the Israeli culture. You know, if you can't show vulnerability, you laugh on it, you laugh about it. Okay, so you use sarcasm as a defense. So again, if you, if you think about it, this, is, this goes really deep because it means that this def defensive structure that we take on could also in be influenced by the culture. So again, if you, if you take it back to your practice or to group therapy, you know, so some of the behaviors, some of the defenses that might come up, the protection that people might, might bring up, could be culturally based. I can tell you from my own experience, coming to California was a real big softening process. <laughs> I was a military officer, okay? I spent four and a half years in the military, and my, you know, not my last year, but the one before I was an instructor in a, in a course. And at the end of the course, a six month long course, uh, I, I figure out that my, my students, you know, the soldiers, I uh, actually had a nickname for me, tough guy. <laughs> and so coming to the American culture, that really didn't work well. <laughs> Especially not in California. Okay, and I, ha I had to learn and to really soften up. I have to look at my own defensive structure of like I'm not vulnerable and, and to work on that and to realize, you know, to be able to sh share and express more vulnerability, that's, it's, it's there, but it's just not, you know, I'm not used to showing it and it's part of that defensive structure, okay? And I gotta tell you, it's still a work in progress. <laughs> okay, 
Yeah, so if you have someone like me, for example, in your group, you know, like I used to be, you know, I, I might have challenged other people without even actually noticing it. Not as a, a purpose, but it's just as a way of being, as like this is the way of being that I used to have. You know, when I'm saying things directly, or when I'm saying things that sounds aggressive, are actually just part of the defensive structure and part of like the common language in some way in a different culture. Okay. Um, another thing, interesting thing is, we're running a little bit out of time, so um, another interesting thing is that the next episode, she actually makes up with her boyfriend and she de they decide to get married. Going back and forth really fast. And uh, she, she talks about inviting the therapist to the wedding. In the American version, she said something like, um, you know, we were, I was talking to Andrew and we were thinking about inviting you to the wedding and for a moment you were on our list, but I know that you won't come, so we kind of took you off. So she doesn't even give him a chance. The Israeli version, she says, um, so I was talking to um, Andrew and we were talking about our guest list for the wedding and we really would like you, you to come to the wedding. And not just you, also your wife. And um, uh, we would like you to even be the best man. <laughs> and would you come to the wedding? And the therapist thinks about it for a second and says, yes, I would come to the wedding. Okay. So again, going back to what's the relationship between therapist and client. Now, of course, some therapists in Israel would say, no, I won't come to the wedding. It's not that everybody would say the same. But if you look at it as a cultural perspective, Okay, he's, um, he's showing a, an attitude of a lot more like, you know, we're kind of on the same level and we're kind of more engaged and social engagement is part of that. Like the distance is a little lower, the privacy is smaller in that way. Okay, so going back to the big picture, I'm going to start to kind of bring back the big picture and summarize so before you go into the uh, breakup groups. You remember we talked about the three levels. We talked about behavior, values, and narratives of beliefs. So, so far we talked a lot about the behavior and the values. We talked about privacy versus connectedness. We talked about um, um, in direct communication and conflict and what does it mean in both culture. And we talked about defensive structure and character strat uh, strategy and all of that. Let's try to go deeper into the narrative level. So, if you have to say one story or one image that is the basis or like the one of the most fundamental basis to American culture, what would you say? What, what is that? What's the story that is kind of like in, rooted in the culture in some way? Yep. Individualism. individualism, right? What else? How do you make it a story? What's the story behind individualism? Right. You start with nothing and then you have this, the strength and the motivation and you pull yourself by your bootstraps and then you can make everything happen. <coughs> right? So in some ways it's the American dream. Right? No matter what socioeconomic status you're coming from, if you work hard, really talented, you'll make it. And you, when you make it, it's for you, it's your profit, right? it's your success, you do it by yourself and then you can be rich and famous which means you're happy. Unless you read all the newspaper on the, you know, Safeway stand, you know, about all the life of the rich and happy, rich and famous, which are not happy. But that's the story, okay? And this story affects a lot of values, because it affects individualism as a value. Privacy, right? It's about me. More like, you know, self-centered self in some way. Talks about uh, the value of, of, of success. Right, kind of moving the ladder of a socioeconomic status. It's not doesn't matter where you come from. It's more like where you want to get. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. It's true, it also changes by generations, right? There's a generation of like just having a nice house and food on the table, that's success. And there's a generation in which if you don't have five million dollars in the bank, that's, you know, you're still not successful. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's also changes. For those of you who know the Jewish culture of the Israeli culture, what would you say are, are the main uh, narrative there? Education. Education is an important value. Family, 
other people, okay, yes. connectedness, survival, survival. Yeah, right, together. togetherness, yeah. So I think the the most basic, uh, va most narrative, not value in the Israeli culture, is other people are out to get us. So we have to stick together in order to survive. And we have to outsmart them, education. OK? So the togetherness is not just you know, for the nice value of humanity. It's also because it's a survival. If we don't stick together, we might be distinct. And if you look, uh, if you look at, the, at the holidays, the Jewish holidays, almost all of them have the same theme. Someone tried to kill us. <laughs> they didn't succeed. So let's eat. <laughs> yeah? This is the Jewish culture in two sentences. Now you don't have to learn about that culture, you know it. Okay? And if you look at it, you have, you know, if that's the narrative, you can understand a lot of the values. That's why conflict is ingrained. That's why togetherness is so important, it's survival. That's why there's a strong group orientation. Okay, you know, Jews li lived in exile for a lot of time, so of course family becomes and community becomes important because you're a minority. Like a lot of minorities in the US. There's a lot more tendency towards togetherness and community if you look at the minorities in the US, right? Uh, there's also a sense of urgency. There's roughness that comes in the Israeli culture. Again, if you look at it, that's the narrative. If that's the narrative of we are in danger, Okay, then we have to be strong. We cannot be weak. That's why we build out those defenses. Okay? So those are, the, those are the narratives. I think once you understand the basic narratives of a culture, it re, you know, the, most of the culture makes sense. So if you're thinking about uh, you know, people that comes to your group you know, from different culture, if it's uh, you know, Hispanic culture, African-American, or Asian culture, what are the stories that are told? What is the right person? What is a good person there? Okay, what is a successful person there? Or it's, uh, sometimes it's not a person, what is a successful family there? Right, sometimes it's not even about a person, it's about like the ties of the community. It's like, you know, in-laws, they live with you. Okay, you do what, you know, your parents tell you. It's, so the identity is even not the personal level, it's, it's more of a group level of a family level identity. Okay. Um, a few more So, to give you a little bit more of a tool, I have this in a handout in the back of the room on the table, so when you go to, uh, you, to break up groups, you can take it. This is a model, I actually went to a, yes? Right, right, starting with Woody Allen. <laughs> Yeah, or go to therapy. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's because it's all because of the Jewish mom, of course. <laughs> okay. So um, this is a model that's coming actually from a commercial company called Richard Lewis Communication, but I found very effective to just understand the variety, like how much people could be different on a lot of different scales. And it shows cultures on three different axes, three different points. Uh, left one, bottom here, is called linear active. Top one is called multi-active, and this, this third one is reactive. And they take uh, almost most of the countries in the world, and on your papers you're actually going to have that, including the names of the countries, and also characteristics for each one of them. Uh, and they put them on some point on these axes, usually between two points. Like, for example, over here, which is close to the linear active, but on the axis with the multi-active, or over here between those two axes. And th that distinction actually really helps to, to position people on that. And I'll just give you a very brief over that. So linear active culture over here, which is the US is here, very close to that. So it's pretty strong on the linear active um, 
uh, line are very rational, data-oriented and fact-oriented, logical. Show me results, show me numbers, where are you going to, what's your goal, what are your goals, where do you want to get, don't get too emotional. It's okay to express emotions, but not too much. Okay? They talk, they talk and they listen half of the time. Uh, very uh, job-oriented, very task-oriented. Very likes, likes control very much. So all of these are the linear active type of cultures, and US is very strong. Multi-active culture, which Israel is somewhere over there. So kind of a little bit closer to the linear, but much more into the multi-active. As you can see with the, with the color of it, it's a very emotional-based culture. So passion and emotion are more important in some way, or more valued in some way, than just being logical. Yeah, logical is important, but if you're passionate about that, that's really important. If you look at their communication style, they talk and listen at the same time. <laughs> so they don't wait for that. Um, if you look at like task and, 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 um, and, and goals, so they, they plan the big stuff. They don't plan the small stuff. The, the small stuff is going to figure it out along the way. What's important is we're together and we're going to the same goal. So it's more, a lot more emotional oriented, more family oriented, more group oriented, and it's less about the facts and the, and the figures and the goals. <laughs> I didn't mean to say it, but now that I'm saying it, it's really funny. It, it says it has, they have good excuses. Which is really true. <laughs> Actually, Laura is saying that when she's late to one of the sessions, she says, I, you know, I'm sorry I'm late, but I have a really good excuse. She's only saying that in the Israeli version. <laughs> they're flexible with rules. Flexible with rules. Rules are you know, okay, but they're, but they're not that important. They're not like the, you know, the ultimate truth. Okay? So this is part of the multi-active cultures. Reactive cultures are a lot more of the Asian cultures, if you know it. So they listen more than they talk. Emotions are not OK. Over here, emotions are OK. Don't get too exaggerated. Here, emotions are really OK. Actually, you're expected. Here, no emotion at all. Emotion, it's really not OK. OK? Losing face and respect is really important here. Very community-oriented, very family-oriented, even to the, you know, ex you know, the, op the opposite of individualism, like group-based culture. Very relationship-oriented. Really difference in terms of um, um, uh, power. So if you're above me in the hierarchy in the in job or in corporation, you're very far from me, and I have to give you respect and I have to be quiet when you're talking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so those are the those are the the main thing, and I'll just I'll tell you one. Oh, I'm beyond time. So I'll tell you. Should I tell you one quick story or not? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Chaim. I worked in high tech before I became a therapist in the tech industry, and we sold we, we sold really a multi-million um, uh, products, uh, both for the UK and the US. It was like five five to ten million dollars for each one of the sales. And I have to tell you, looking back, we lost millions of dollars for not understanding culture. Why? Because in the Israeli culture, once you sign a contract, what does this mean? It means that now we're in this together, we're a team. So, you know, if I do something a little bit to the left or to the right, you'll forgive me because you know we're a team and I'll forgive you. So yes, there's a contract, but if we decided to do this instead of that, we're fine. If we came in with a product, you know, 10 days late, but we actually stayed and gave you extra support, then we're fine. American culture, not so much. UK culture, definitely not. Okay, if you said in the contract you give it by July 10th and you, you're July 15, so the contract say $10,000 penalty for every day. So five days, that's $50,000, please. And we couldn't figure out, we couldn't understand that. We were like, you know, we thought they were just uptight and just, you know, terrible as clients. We didn't understand, no, it's just, that's, that's the culture. So a lot of money went, went away because of that. Move the slide. Okay, so. We talked about a lot of different uh, aspects of, you know, of culture. Um, you know, looking at the behavior, the values, the narratives, uh, looking at, you know, analyzing it specifically for Israel and America and trying to draw conclusion to group therapy and to multiculturalism. So as you're going into discussion right now, I was trying to think, okay, what should I send you into discussion with? And this is such a complex uh, topic, so it's really hard to narrow it down. But uh, I tried my best. 
and I came up with three points, okay? One, this discussion, once you, we come into multicultural group in, in the American culture, you know, we, we have to think about, we have to address in some way the issues of privilege and oppression. And how you do that, that's a really, uh, you know, topic for elaborate discussion. The other thing is looking at intervention and therapeutic strategy, like would you change your frame or would you change your interventions or your strategy as a facilitator when it's a multicultural group or it's a, uh, it's a group that has specific culture which is not necessarily white American? So that's another really big question, I think. And in, together with that is your role as a facilitator. Who are you? Again, like what's the role of the, of the therapist or the facilitator in that way? And the third one, which is I think what we were speaking most of the time in this talk, is negotiating the models of the world. So when we come into conflict, what does it mean? What is conflict and how does it look like? When you come into connection, how does connection look like? Closeness, intimacy, connection in the group. Okay? When we have a lot of, you know, a lot of perspective on like what's the, you know, the, a good life to be, what's healthy and unhealthy. These are all negotiating models of the world and we have our own models as part of our own culture. Okay, and training and personal stuff, but also the culture. And now someone else from a different culture might have different ideas around that. Okay, so negotiating models of the world. And last piece is, um, you know, what's really important is this whole issue of cross-culture is cultural competen competency, which means actually breaks down into three areas. Having awareness of your own culture and your own biases having knowledge about the cultures in which you're working with, like people that come from those cultures, having knowledge about them, and then third one is having skills. So having the right skills to do interventions and to do the right, uh, you know, the best therapy work with, uh, with specific uh, people, with specific cultures. Okay, anything more before the break?